of urbanists, so yeah. Use the word urbanist in the whole thing. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Donnie Gallagher Cohen. I'm the president of the Buffalo Niagara Partnership, and we are thrilled to have uh, standing room only uh, attendance for this morning's event, which is critically important to our region. And I think you're going to be um, very pleasantly surprised by what you hear, and I, I hope you're enthusiastic about the opportunities that the message presents for our community. Uh, before we get started, I would like to do a little bit of uh, housekeeping thank our title sponsor, Simonelli Real Estate Corporation, our presenting sponsor, Ecology and Environment, our event sponsor, Jayco Fleischman and Mugel, and our underwriter, uh, Harris Beach. So please, a round of applause for our generous. <laughs> Economics and Sustainability Series, an educational component of the One Region Forward initiative that the partnership manages. As you know, One Region Forward is a collaborative approach by many partners. The partnership is one of them. Just by a show of hands, how many of you have been to one of the other sustainability events for One Region Forward? And that is just great. Terrific. Thank you. Um, our 2014 series topics are being developed, and you have information on the proposed topics at your table somewhere, and we are looking for your input. So please take a moment to, to take a look at that. Uh, sustainability and what it means to our region is, is important to the business community and to the community overall. And the partnership has been involved in sustainable development initiatives through the work of our uh, Development Advisory Council and initiatives such as the Buffalo Building Reuse Project. And just yesterday, as a matter of fact, Mayor Brown had a housing forum on, uh, housing forum on downtown housing in our offices to talk about how we could accelerate um, the use of, of of our buildings downtown to create more residential opportunity. Uh, we do this and we are involved in this because it's really important that our employers have a voice in these discussions and that's incredibly critical. Uh, as you know, all good decision making comes uh, from having various points of view and uh, we, we bring one voice to a, to a process that has tremendous community input in, which is very, very valuable. The public sector has plays a role with us in terms of the development of policies that are, are really appropriate for sustainable development. And that's one thing that we are also working on from an advocacy point of view. So as you can see, what's happening here in our community, I think maybe for the first time, uh, the public and the private sector and the community all working together hand in hand to really develop policies to move this region forward quite literally. And you are all a key part of that, and we appreciate the time and energy that you are putting into this process to make sure that we have really good decision making and policy development for our community. Our presenter today, Chuck Marone, is the Executive Director of Strong Towns, and he's going to discuss how we make that happen and how public sector decision making on spending and development policy can add to the health and sustainability of our community. And moderating today's panel is Hal Morris, Executive Director of the Greater Buffalo Niagara Regional Transportation Council. Hal, you, you almost have a card that's about this big. That's <laughs> um, Hal is a key partner in the One Region Forward Initiative and will give us some more detail on what to expect in 2014. Please uh, join me in welcoming Hal Morris. <laughs>
how this region could develop, what kind of investments we would need, and how the future would look over the coming decades. Work groups within the One Region Forward are fully engaged and now in the business of establishing transformative policies and strategic investments. Where we're going in the coming year is an implementation focus that includes a mechanism for coordination and cooperative decision making. Education, an extremely important component of understanding what this all means and how to reach the tailor. Deployment of strategic investments and progress measures so that we know that we're getting there. What do we need? Increasingly, uh, regional self-reliance, uh, ability to control our own destiny, not linked only to outside assistance and support, basically the creation of a sustainable business plan for the region. So we're pleased today to have Chuck Ramon because that's really what Strong Towns is all about. If you look at his mission statement, it's a supportive model for growth that allows America's towns to become financially strong and reliable. Again, key components how we control our own destiny and continue to transform all our diners. So with that, we're going to introduce Chuck and uh, look forward to the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, yesterday I got off the plane at the uh, Buffalo Airport and um, I asked the guy how things were going and he said, uh, well, I'm awfully cold. <laughs> Yeah, that was my response too. Um, oh, here we go. It was uh, 17 below on my way to the airport yesterday. So uh, I'm headed to Erie this afternoon and told I might run into snow. So I will probably do that all the time. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming out today and being here and for the invitation. Uh, our organization, Strong Towns, is a 501c3 nonprofit. Based out of Minnesota, we work uh, nationally with cities across the country. Uh, this is our curbside chat program. Uh, I'll give you some more information on that at the very end. Our mission is to support a model of growth that allows America's towns to become financially strong and resilient. Uh, we, our organization is called Strong Towns. We talk about cities, we talk about counties, we talk about parishes and boroughs and towns. Uh, we're really talking about our local units of government, the kind of base units of government that we use to make day-to-day -day decisions about our lives. We could have named our organization Strong Local Units of Government. That would have been a really long web address. Uh, we went with Strong Towns. If I talk about cities or towns or whatever, just interpolate in your mind, we're talking about local units of government. There's three big takeaways from this presentation. I'll begin with this and end with this. The first is that the current path that cities are on is not financially stable. The second, the future for most cities is not going to resemble the recent past. And then third, the main determinant of future prosperity for cities will be the ability of local leaders to transform their communities. I want to frame this conversation by going kind of back uh, in time. These are two ancient civilizations. These are artist renderings. The one on the left is a place called Ur in the Fertile Crescent. It's the oldest human civilization that we've excavated, somewhere around 5,000 BC. On the right is an artist rendering of, uh, of ancient Rome. Uh, if you look at these two cities, they were built around the predominant transportation technology of the day, that being your two feet. Uh, these were cities of people that walked, and they were built around people who walked. Uh, you can fast forward in the history all the way up to, this is my hometown, Brandon, Minnesota, back in the early 1900s. And this also was a place built around that same technology. It was built around people who walked. Uh, the layout, the design, the spacing, uh, everything about this city, while the, you know, the building materials and the culture and the architecture is a little bit different. The essential layout of the place is, is very similar to what you've seen for thousands and thousands of years. Beginning really before the Depression and then stalling out and, and starting with in, in earnest after World War II, uh, in this country, we began to build in a different style around the new transportation technology of the day, that being the automobile. We designed different building types, different building styles, different ways to lay things out and connect them, all based around this new transportation technology. If you were to ask people today, 2013, to explain this transformation, uh, you know, how do we go from this to, uh, to this? Uh, we would describe most likely a narrative of progress. We used to walk everywhere, and so we built places around people who walked. 
We now drive everywhere, and so we build places around people who drive. Someday we will have jet cars, and we will build places around people who drive jet cars. And someday we will teleport, and our cities will look completely different than they do now. That is a very comforting and affirming narrative of progress, one that we kind of cling to. I'd like to give you a different narrative uh, to just put in your mind as a seed as we start this conversation today. When you look at these cities, the layout, the design, the technology, uh, the, the understanding of how to build a place, this didn't just happen. These places here, even though they're ancient, they're thousands of years old, uh, themselves were the byproduct of generations and generations, literally thousands of years of trial and error, experimentation. By the time we got to build places like this, we had been trying and failing at building places for a long, long, long time. And when you get to you know, the early 1900s, whether it's in the Buffalo Niagara region, whether it's in my part of the world in central Minnesota, you're looking at a design and approach to building places that had been tested through trial and error experimentation over many, many, many millennia. When you look at this approach, and you know, we, we drove the Robert Moses Expressway here. Uh, you know, someone we studied back in planning school. It's fascinating. For me, it's probably old hat for you guys, but for me, it's fascinating to see that name on a highway. Uh, you know, you you look at the ideas behind building this. Very brilliant people, very intelligent people, but the knowledge for doing this is not something that was tested over time. We didn't try this out in Pennsylvania, see if it worked, and then if it did, we imported it to New York. We just started doing this everywhere, all at once. They were theories, they were fantastic theories, they were brilliant, they were designed to make our world and make our lives better. But we're now 60, 70 years into this experiment, and we can start to see through the tests that we've done uh, that things aren't working out exactly as we maybe envisioned they would when we started to do this two, three generations ago. We are living through, literally, humanity's greatest experiment. And not just a social experiment, but a cultural, financial, and political experiment as well. And we're gonna talk about the implications of that now today. If you look at the way we finance growth and development, it is dramatically different than it was 100 years ago and, and any time prior. At the local level today, there's really three mechanisms we use to create growth and development. The first uh, we call transfer payments between governments. This is the idea that the federal government, the state government, has a role in creating growth at the local level uh, through grants, through low interest loans, through programs. The second is Department of Transportation spending. This is the idea that through transportation spending, we can create facilities that will induce growth, will create growth. We put in the frontage road, we put in the interchange, we put in the new signal, we widen the lanes, we get growth and development. The third is through debt. And while public sector debt is a big part of this equation, private sector debt is an even larger part. The ability to get long-term financing, to have that sold off on a secondary market, to increase liquidity, uh, allows us to finance more things, leverage more, and to build more. These three mechanisms come together at the local level to create growth, and that growth, of course, is good because as a local government, it increases our tax revenue. It gives us the money that we want and that we need to be able to do the things that our constituents are asking us to do. There's some really powerful incentives to look at these transactions in a purely positive way. When the federal government comes in with a grant or a program, uh, when the state comes in with a, a low interest loan or, or some type of initiative, when the DOT comes in and does a project that affects our community, or when the private sector comes in and leverages uh, liquidity in order to create new growth. The cost to us as local taxpayers, the cost that we pay as a local government is usually very small. There might be some local match, we might have to pay for a little bit of upsizing, we might have some staff time, but generally the bulk of the investment comes from outside the community. The benefit that we get though is substantial. Uh, all of a sudden now we get all this new growth, all this new tax base, all the new job creation, and that impacts our cash flow today in a very positive way. The catch is that we at the local level agreed to take over the long-term liability for maintaining and servicing all of these systems. We are, in a sense, exchanging 
a near-term benefit in cash for an unknown long-term liability. If you think this over through multiple generations over the long term, there's only one of two ways that this makes sense as a strategy. Either growth is going to continue at ever accelerating rates. In other words, we're always going to be able to induce and create a bunch of new growth that will have very low upfront costs uh, with very high revenues. And we can use those revenues to pay for all the obligations that we have outstanding. Or the pattern of development, the actual way we build, is going to generate more in wealth and revenue for us than it generates in long-term costs. I think we intuitively understand that the first one is not true. Uh, unfortunately, the second one is not true either. And this is where, for a, a few moments, this presentation will get a, a little bit technical. Uh, I am an engineer. I will walk you through this uh, as gently as I can. Um, we have made uh, a, an obsession about studying real-world developments. I personally am allergic to theoretical models. And so we've gone out and, and tried to say, how do we understand the, the way that we're building and the finances behind them? The best way we can do that is by actually looking at what we built and how the finances work out. And so I'm going to show you a few examples here. This one is probably the simplest style of development you can build. This is a road with a dead end cul-de-sac. There's no uh, through traffic, no commercial traffic here, no chance that there'll ever be any through traffic. The only people that use this road are the people that live on it. These are two, two and a half acre lots. This is the kind of thing you'd find on the far edge of the community. Uh, when this was built in the mid-1990s, it was a gravel road. The city insisted that it be paved. The city went out and paved it. The city paid half the cost, and the property owners paid the other half. We asked the question, okay, based on the taxes that the city's collecting from the people within this development, how long is it going to take the city to recoup the half the cost they spent to build the road? And the answer is 37 years. Now, the road's not going to last anywhere near 37 years. But based on the taxes the city's collecting, it's going to take the city that long just to break even on the project. This is a little more intense development. This, uh, these are half acre, three quarter acre lots. Again, you can see that it's a closed loop system uh, with a dead end cul-de-sac. There's no commercial traffic here. There's no through traffic. This is just a, a residential development. The only people that use this road are the people that live along it uh, for the most part. Um, this was built in the early 1980s. It had completely fallen apart. The city went out and fixed it. The cost was $354,000. We asked the question, okay, based on the taxes that the city's collecting from the people that live within this development, the only people that use it to any substantive degree, how long is it gonna take the city to recoup what they just spent to fix this road? The answer is 79 years. We then asked the question, okay, let's say the city wanted to try to collect enough taxes from these people uh, to actually fix the road that they live on the next time it fell apart. What would that mean? It would mean an immediate 46% increase in taxes with annual increases of 3% over inflation every year for the next 25 years with all of that new revenue going just to maintain the roadway. Now sometimes people say, well, okay, Chuck, we get it. We know we lose money on residential property. We make it up on commercial property. Commercial is our cash cow, that's where we make all of our revenue. Uh, this is a business park. This is the kind of thing that we build out on the edge of the communities and kind of the build it and they will come fashion. Uh, this was built in the mid 1990s. Uh, the idea was we would attract a bunch of new growth and business development that would happen in this park. Uh, it's got the wide industrial streets. It's got the sewer, water, storm sewer, the full utilities. Uh, this is now completely built out. The city felt this was such a successful project that they want to repeat it on property they own right next door. They just want to mirror this exact site uh, right next door. We asked the question, if we could invest the same amount of money and get the same amount of return, would that be a good investment for the city? The cost in today's dollars would be $2.1 million. The amount of investment that's taken place in that park is $6.6 .6 million. Now, pause for a second and understand. Of that investment that's happened in that park, four of those lots are a church. Now the church is a very important part of the community. Uh, I go to church, we need churches in our community, but the church is not paying any taxes to the city. Two of the lots are a school bus maintenance facility. Again, schools are a very important part of the community. I've got two kids that go to public schools. 
but the school district is not paying any money to the city. Uh, one of the lots is a county maintenance facility. One of the lots is a city maintenance facility. Of the remaining lots in this development, the ones that theoretically would be private sector taxpayers, every single one was either sold for a dollar and or was given a long-term tax subsidy in order to attract them to move into this park. For the sake of our analysis, we assume that every single lot would be built by a full private sector taxpayer. It would be non-subsidized and pay their full freight. If that were the case, and if every dollar of tax revenue were devoted to paying down that debt, it would take the city almost three decades, 29 years, just to break even. That's 29 years where everybody else's taxes in town would need to go up to plow the snow off the road, to mow the ditches, provide police protection, fire protection, and every other service that would be needed, because this place would still be taking that long just to break even on this debt. I used to go through and do about a dozen examples, and I would see people's eyes start to glaze over, and they would have this pain, like, okay, we get it. Um, there's a bunch of examples on our website. I'll give you that address at the end. If someone wants to delve into the numbers and see a bunch of case studies, uh, they're there, and I welcome you to go there and take a look at them. But I'll, I'll cut to the chase here so we can get on to some other things. Um, this is a cash flow diagram. And I, again, apologize for being an engineer. I like graphs. I'll walk you through this one. Let's say that a developer comes to town and says, you know, I would like to build this new development. I'm not asking for any public subsidies. I'm not asking for any variances to your rules. I'll meet all your rules. I'll build all the sewer system and the water system and the sidewalks and the streets and the pipes and the valves and the pumps and everything that's needed for this development. I'll build all the commercial properties. I'll build all the residential properties. The only thing I'm asking for you, the city, is that when I'm done with everything, I'd be allowed to turn over the maintenance of the infrastructure to you. What would we say as a city? We'd say, fantastic, right? We spend nothing. We get all this new growth. And, and it, you know, it, it's, it's, this is a wonderful transaction for us. Let's say in the back of our minds, you know, we've heard of this strong towns thing, and we say, you know, we're going to be prudent people. Uh, we're going to take the money that now is coming in, and we're going to take the portion that would normally go to maintain all this stuff, and we're going to set it aside. And every year when that money comes in, we're going to set it aside, and we're going to allow it to accumulate. And then when we get to, you know, a couple decades out, when we have to go out and make good on that promise, and actually maintain and fix this stuff. We use that money to do it. This is what that looks like. In year one, the development's brand new, all the infrastructure is brand new, the cost to you is nothing, the new tax revenue comes in, you set aside that portion that would go to maintaining stuff and, and put it in an account. In the second year, you add to that, in the third year, you add to that, and every year you go on, you continue to add to it. You can see when you get out a couple of decades, you've accumulated quite a bit of money. Everything is relatively new, not costing you anything. You're just essentially making money, right? But the problem is when you get to, in this example, year 25, and you have to actually go out and fix something, what you find is that the cumulative amount of money that is brought, been brought in is insufficient. And from a cash flow standpoint, you go far into the negative. Now, Cities are not one development. Cities are a collection of developments, a collection of neighborhoods. So let's say that our developer comes back a couple years later and says, you know, that project worked out so well for me, it worked out so well for you, uh, I would like to do it again. A similar size, similar scale project. And in fact, every year from that point on, every other year you get, a developer comes in doing a similar size project. In other words, this is the ideal scenario for any city, it's nice, steady, uh, consistent growth over time. And you take that revenue from the new development, this new revenue that's coming in, you set it aside and you allow it to accumulate so that you can make good on the promise you made when you accepted that infrastructure as a public liability. Here's what that looks like. In year one, you've got your first development that comes in, you've set the money aside. In year three, you've got a second one. In year four, you've got a third. Year seven, year nine. And you can see that over time, not only does uh, you know, the revenue that you're getting from each development grow, uh, the, you know, the amount that you've accumulated. But with all these new developments coming online, all this new growth happening, your, your revenue, your cash starts to accelerate upwards. And when you get to year 25, the year you have to make good on that very first promise, you've got to spend a little bit of money, but it's not a big deal, right? You've had all 
this growth. Uh, and so you've got the revenue there. The growth creates what we call the illusion of wealth. Because as we all intuitively understand, if you lose money on every transaction, you don't ultimately make it up in volume. If you lose money over the long term on every project that you take on, the further you go out in the time horizon, the more downward pressure there is on your budget. Now we started this conversation by saying this is a very young experiment. We're 67 years into this. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're just getting going, but I've had people stand up and say, well, Chuck, I get what you're saying. Uh, you know, our growth in this pattern started 60, 70 years ago. Uh, why, you know, if you're, what you're showing us is right, why didn't we go broke a long time ago? How have we gotten this far? And the answer lies in this graph here. This is a graph of debt. Now, we're all familiar to one degree or another with the narrative of our public debt, right? Our public debt is enormous. 17, 18 trillion dollars. Uh, I've had seven quarters of calculus. I'm not gonna pretend that I can grasp what a trillion dollars is, let alone 18 of them. Uh, I remember when I was in grade school, we had a uh, the weekly reader. Do you guys have the weekly reader? The little breakout box that said, if you, if you converted the national debt to dollar bills and stacked them on top of each other, it would go to the moon and back 23 times or something like that. Right? As if, you know, for a fourth grader, Replacing one abstract concept with another abstract concept <laughs> would clarify everything, right? So our, our national debt is this enormously huge, unfathomable number. And this graph here, the, the bottom line, the blue line, is the growth in our federal debt, that unfathomable number. Uh, the black one right above it is our GDP. This green one, the one that soars up like that, that's uh, our private sector debt. That's debt that you and I share. That's home mortgages, commercial real estate loans, auto loans, credit cards, margin interest accounts, student loans. The way we finance the first generation of this new experimental way of building is by taking our savings and then reinvesting that illusion of wealth back into generating more growth. When that became insufficient to everything going, when we actually had outflows of cash, not just inflows of cash. It took us a while to figure out what to do, but we gradually shifted from an economy based on growth through savings and investment to an economy based on growth through debt accumulation. And you can see as we cross over into the third life cycle of this experiment, or kind of the third generation of this new approach, that growth through debt accumulation became such an important part of our economy that we actually allowed it to become predatory. We actually allowed systems to arise uh, that in encourage people who couldn't afford a home to buy a home, people who could afford modest homes to buy large homes, people who could afford large homes to, to speculate on multiple extravagantly large homes. You don't need a down payment. You don't need to show you can make the payments. You don't even need a job. We allowed our systems to prey on our neighbors because we needed the growth. Our ability to continue this experiment by having ever accelerating rates of private sector growth is just simply not there. Obviously, there's some huge implications. The, the, the mechanisms of growth that we become accustomed to are waning. The federal government, the state government are vastly overcommitted. We all know and understand that they're not there the way they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago with all the money to try to create and induce growth at the local level. The DOTs are functionally broke. Your DOT is vastly overcommitted, having far more miles of, of roadway to maintain than they have reasonable amounts of cash flow, even under the, the, the most grandest of tax increase projections uh, that have been floated. The private sector is simply tapped out. We don't have the debt capacity to be able to continue to borrow at accelerating rates to keep all of this going. What this means for us at the local level is that we're going to be forced to absorb the cost of our own development path. If we want that road fixed, we're going to have to fix it. If we want that pipe repaired, we're going to have to find the money to do that. This can't be done in the current pattern of development without some fantastically large tax increases and or some devastatingly large cuts in services. Now, I didn't come here to tell you what you already know. 
right? I mean, everybody at every level of government is dealing with these two variables. How large is the tax increase going to be? Who's going to pay for it? How deep is the service cut going to be? And where are we going to make it? That's kind of the story of government over the last five, six years, right? It's important at the local level, critical, that we see the third variable in that sentence. The third variable being the current pattern of development. As long as we continue to build in a way that is functionally insolvable, there's no way that our cities are going to avoid becoming functionally insolvent themselves. As long as we continue to build in a pattern that creates for us an illusion of wealth today, but enormous long-term liabilities, there's no way that our cities are going to avoid defaulting on their obligations whether formally like Detroit or informally like many, many cities that are letting roads go and neighborhoods fall into decline and everything else that we see. We literally have to start a conversation about how we build a more productive America. So what does this look like? And I had to put this slide in a, a while back because as I was going around and talking, we're gonna talk now the rest of the time here about things that we can do and how we look at our cities differently and how we wring more value out of them. Uh, I would get to the end and someone would always stand up and say, Chuck, um, you come here, you freaked us out, you, you didn't give us a solution. What is the solution to this problem? And we get this question over and over and over again. It was frustrating to me because I felt like I was giving people solutions, you know, giving people ideas and things that we should be doing to address this complex set of problems. It took me a while to realize that I was hearing something different than what was being asked. What I was hearing asked was, Chuck, what is the solution? What was really being asked was fundamentally different. What was really being asked was this. What can someone else change about what they're doing so that I don't have to change anything about what I'm doing? <laughs> I don't know of any such solution. Uh, I am, you know, we have created for ourselves a very complex set of problems. They defy a solution in, in, the, in the sense that we've come over the last 60 years to understand you know, silver bullet ideas, big solutions, big ideas. Where we're at defies that kind of thing. We're really into what we call at Strong Towns, rational responses. How do we look at this complex set of problems that we have and respond rationally to them as intelligent, thoughtful people working uh, for the betterment of our communities? And when we start to talk about rational responses, I always go back to this photo. Now, this is my hometown back in the, the early 1900s. Brainerd, Minnesota is today two and a half hours north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. So, you know, this is the middle of nowhere back in this period of time. Uh, this is literally the, you know, the frontier of the U.S., the middle of the North Woods. Uh, but look at this place. You know, look at, look at, look at this place. I, I, as a planner, I just completely geek out over this. You know, I look at the, the way the buildings frame the public realm, the way that they're spaced. Uh, the good segmentation of the public space, the, the, the facades of these buildings, their symmetry, the way they front the public realm. This place was absolutely spectacular. A bunch of North Woods lumberjack, illiterate hicks in the middle of nowhere, built this fantastic place. How do they know how to do this? Let me ask you some questions. How thick was their zoning code? How many boards and commissions did they have to go through uh, to get an approval to build something? How much, how many federal and state grants did they get to build things here? How much tax subsidy did they give out? You know, you can go through the litany of things that we do today as just a matter of course, like here's how we create growth, here's how we create development, here's how we create prosperity. They had absolutely none of them, yet they built places that were financially really strong and healthy. And the way we know that is because if they weren't, they went away, right? If you look at uh, you know, the same street today, here's what it looks like 60 years later. After all of our growth initiatives, after all of our attempts to create prosperity and wealth, this is what we've got, a wasteland of parking and vacant space. And if you want to understand in one picture why cities around this country are going broke, it's right there. In those two blocks, there's a half million dollars of public infrastructure investment. 
What is our return on that investment? Nothing. We're not getting any money back. Cities around the country have blocks and blocks, miles and miles, that look exactly like this. I was giving a talk in, in a Boise, Idaho, at a university, and a student in the back raised their hand when I got to this slide and said, Chuck, uh, I'm from Costa Rica. We're a very poor country. Uh, we don't build anything like you do. When we build, we have to build one block at a time. And before we can build the next block, we have to make sure that everything on that first block is filled in. We don't have huge gaps. Uh, we don't have big spaces between. We have to build small and incremental. Uh, we're a very poor country. We just can't afford to do that. We're a very poor country now, too. We can't afford to do this either. And for a while, our illusion of wealth allowed us to not think about the implications of that. But we can't overlook it any longer. We have to start having a conversation about how we make our places more productive. So the first step is that we need to stop doing the silly things we're doing now. Uh, the notion of build it and they will come is a fantastic movie plot, right? Uh, you've got cornfields, Iowa, baseball. It's got a little bit of everything, right? Is a horrible economic development strategy. Yet, in what we are calling the late phase, the desperation phase of the suburban experiment, uh, it has become the default operating setting for local governments. We now, for some reason, are expected to be at the local government level, the dumb money at the table. The, the people that go out there and when a project is not financially viable, we're the ones that come in and provide that financing, that gap. We're the, we're the difference makers. That isn't the way that wealth has ever been built in this world. Let me show you how wealth is built in cities. Do you guys recognize this street here? Look familiar? This is my hometown back in 1870. Okay? This is this exact same street 30 years prior. This is the very first iteration of my hometown. And literally, you know, you, you can imagine these lumberjacks, like the train stops, they, they fall out of the car, they walk out, they cut down the trees that are there, they plant them in the logs, and they plant them in, the, and they throw up these little shacks, right? The smallest level of investment that you can make to get a city started. Every city built prior to World War II in the entire world began like this. Niagara Falls began like this. Buffalo began like this. They all started, Manhattan started like that. A little collection of minimal, tiny pop-up investments. And for a variety of complex reasons, reasons that defy our ability to project, or to predict, even to understand fully in retrospect, a lot of these places failed. They just went away. And what happened when they went away? Did your pension fund drop by 25%? Did we have to have a trillion dollar bailout of Wall Street banks? Did unemployment skyrocket? Cities go bankrupt? No. What happened? When places like this failed, it was a modest, small investment. The people here would just pluck the windows out, take the iron off the walls, and move on to the next successful city. For a variety of complex reasons, reasons that defy our ability to predict, defy our ability to project, defy our ability to even fully comprehend in retrospect, a lot of these cities were successful. And when they were successful, what happened? Over a broad area, over a long period of time, they would grow incrementally up, incrementally out, and incrementally more intense. And so after 30 years, this little pop-up street became that. And in 40 more years, the city would continue on the same historic framework that we've used for millennia to build incrementally up, incrementally more intense and incrementally out, and you've got a street that looked exactly like this. Granite, brick, rock facades. You don't create wealth by going to the casino and putting it all on red. You create wealth by having small, modest investments over a broad area, over a long period of time. We all intuitively understand that. And that's what's been lost in this post-World War II development pattern. Let me show you just how powerful this traditional, historic way of building is. These are two identical blocks in my hometown. The one on the left we've called old and blighted, the one on the right is shiny and new. 
Uh, the older blighted rock is run down and nasty. Uh, you can see, you know, it, it's in rough shape. If you look think back to that 1870s pop-up block, this was the 1920s version of that pop-up block. This would have been the far edge of town, and this was the minimal amount of investment you could make uh, just to be in business. The town was growing out incrementally, and these little buildings have been popped up. What happened after they were built? You had the Depression, you had World War II, and then a completely different development style that essentially leapfrogged right over this area and started building further on the edge of town. And these places have stagnated for 90 years. Two blocks over, the exact same size space as this block, um, used to look just like this. The city had it torn down, and now we have a brand new drive through taco joint. Everybody was thrilled about this taco joint. It met all the codes. Uh, we got plenty of parking. We got the cars off the street so the through traffic can move more quickly. Everybody was thrilled about this. Here's what nobody bothered to stop and look at. Look at that old and blighted, that rundown block. It has a total value of $1.1 million. That shiny and new block, the same size area, the same neighborhood, the same thoroughfare, the same amount of public infrastructure. Everything is the same except the style of development on it. It has a total value of only $800,000. That old and blighted block is worth 42% more. And understand what you're looking at. You're looking at the historic development pattern in its infancy. After 90 years of decline, still outperforming, and brand new on its birthday practically, the auto-oriented style, the new experimental style of development. Let me ask you a question. That old and blighted block, let's say we walk out of here today and we understand that the problem that we face at the local level in this country is not a lack of growth. We've had decades of growth. What we lack is productive growth. And so, let's say we walk out of here and we understand that our goal now is to make our cities financially more productive. What will you do over the next decade? Assuming you have no money or very little funds, what will you do over the next decade to make that old and blighted block worth more? Let's say our goal is to double it in a decade. What would you do? Maybe sweep the sidewalks, clean up the facades, change the zoning code so you can actually build a second story. Uh, you could slow the cars down, maybe put in a bike rack, a planter. You could reconnect the sidewalks that were taken out to the neighborhood. There's like a, a myriad of things we could do. And you don't need a professional to tell you what those are. We all intuitively understand what they are. What if you wanted to double the value of that taco joint over the next decade? What would you do? Yeah, yeah, but you don't have any money. You know, tear it down, right? The traditional style of development has enormous upside potential and very limited downside. The new experimental style has very limited upside and a downside potential that can literally go zero or even negative. And we all know the trajectory of the taco joint, right? 20 years from now, there'll be a new taco joint a mile up the street. This one will be turned into a used car lot. Ten years after that, it will get boarded up, they'll be selling drugs at the back, and there'll be some grant application to tear it down and, and build something new, right? We've been around long enough where we've seen this happen over and over again. The same kind of effect goes on at the edge of our communities. This is the Mills Fleet Farm store in my hometown. Uh, you guys don't have Mills Fleet Farm here. Uh, Midwestern big box store. When you walk in, uh, you've got auto parts, uh, animal feed, lumber, Guns and ammo, camouflage lingerie. That's the <laughs> product of those you find in Mills Fleet Farm. Very successful. Uh, there's a big box that was so successful they doubled the size of it. You've got an auto dealership and a gas station. This is the 17 acre Mills complex. This is 17 acres of downtown. Downtown, kind of run down, nasty. If you've seen the movie Fargo, you've seen a fairly accurate representation of downtown Brainerd. Most of the second and third stories are unoccupied, boarded up, uh, a place that could use some love. When we look at this Mills Fleet Farm site, uh, it has a total value of $0.6 million per acre, $600,000 an acre. Not, nothing to sneeze at, that's a huge sum of money. But when we look at that downtown, uh, the same size area, just a different style of development, it has a total value of $1.1 million per acre, almost 78% more. 
Now, ask yourself a couple of questions. How much should we spend to get that middle school fund? Well, the DOT spent over $100 million just on the bypass of the city uh, where this is located. Uh, the city spent $37 million running sewer out to the site. When I was an engineer, I worked on this right here. Uh, that was a $2 million roadway back here. Uh, this, the MnDOT just redid this intersection a couple years ago. It was half a million dollars just for that intersection. Enormous sums of money have been spent. How much did my generation spend to get that? Nothing. That is the wealth that my ancestors and their contemporaries built slowly and incrementally over time. And what we have done from a financial standpoint is just milk it, right? For decades and decades and decades. Joe Minicosi, I know, was here earlier and, and talked to you guys. Uh, Joe's work, Joe and I are good friends. His work is amazing. Uh, he's gone around the country showing the comparative value of the traditional development pattern. This is a presentation that him and I did in High Point, North Carolina. Uh, what you're looking at here is a map, uh, and the lines upwards show the value, the productivity, the value per square foot of properties within High Point. Uh, you'll never guess where the historic downtown is. Um, you can actually see, you know, comparatively how much more valuable it is. Their, their brand new Walmart, Super Kmart, and all their new development is out here on the edge along the highway. And you can see comparatively the yields that they're getting from that old, run-down, traditional downtown uh, versus the stuff right here. The way we have built, there's a reason why we did it. It was incredibly productive. It was incredibly, incredibly productive. If we're going to start to go back, we have to start asking some different questions. Different questions about our public investments, different questions about our return on investment. Today, if you look at the way we finance projects and the way we put out information on them from the federal government level down to the local government level, we'll say things like this. We're going to make a, an investment. That investment's going to create jobs, it's going to create growth, and it's going to create all of this uh, economic activity. And we'll say things like, you know, we're going to spend a million dollars and there's going to be four million dollars of private sector investment or four million dollars of economic activity that take place. And in our minds, you know, with a simple math standpoint, we're like, wow, we invest a dollar, there's four dollars that happens. That, that's a fantastic return. Can we keep doing that again and again and again? Of course, at the local government level, if it were only that easy, right? Um, where does this money over here come from? The money comes from us, right? It's tax money. But where is that taking place? It's taking place in the private sector. Now, I'm a big private sector guy. This is not a rant against the private sector. But if we're going to be good stewards of the public purse, we have to ask a more important question, especially at the local level. We can't print money. We can't borrow money indefinitely. We, we have to run real finances. We have to ask the question, how much of that stuff from the private sector actually ends up back in our purse? What is our actual return on that investment? How much do we recapture so we can keep this virtuous cycle going again and again and again? It is very, very easy to spend money and create growth. It's the easiest thing in the world. What is much harder is to spend money, create growth, and have that growth create a virtuous cycle where you can do it again and again and again. We have to ask a different set of questions. In order to do that, we have to look at what the second life cycle in engineering school, we study the second life cycle. Uh, and they get this great thing called salvage value, where at the end of the project, you get to salvage it and then walk away. And that works really well when you're Walmart and you can move on to the next store. But when you're a city and you have to fix that overpass, fix that pipe, fix that traffic signal, repave that road, we don't get to just walk away at the second life cycle. We actually don't get to salvage unless we replace. So if you look at the way we put our projects together today, in the first life cycle, we become really good at this. We go to the federal government and say, what kind of grant or loan, what can you help us put together? We go to the state government with the same question. We go to the private sector and say, what contribution can we get from the private market out here? And then we say, what do we have to spend as a city uh, to make this project happen? This is like project administration, right? Back in my engineering days, I did all kinds of interviews uh, for projects, and when we go in, nobody cared about how good we were at engineering. Nobody asked us, you know, do you know how to com compute the, the grade of a pipe, or do you know how to size a pump correctly? Nobody cared about any of that. What did they care about? 
Do you know how to get money? Do you know how to run a project uh, with the finances? Do you know how to work with this grant program and that grant program? We are experts at getting projects funded the first time. Here's the problem. When we get to the second life cycle, when we have to go out and fix something, how interested is the federal government in paying to fix those potholes? How interested is the state in repairing that, you know, 20 feet of sidewalk that's heaved up and gone bad? How, how, how enthusiastic is the private sector about coming back in and repairing that pipe that is now settled, uh, that they feel that their bills and their taxes have been paid for for the last 30 years? And so what you find is that the second life cycle is just Mayor Quimby saying, right? This is us. If we're making investments to try to induce and create growth, if we're not getting enough growth in our actual tax revenue to offset all of these revenue streams by the time we have to go out and fix things, we just made a one-time throwaway investment, one that is robbing the wealth of our communities. Here's probably the most familiar way that we do this. Uh, this is something we call a strode. A strode is a, a street road hybrid. Uh, it's the futon of transportation options. If you think of a, a futon as being an uncomfortable couch that makes into an uncomfortable bed, a strode is a piece of transportation infrastructure that's trying to serve two functions at once and doing neither very well. Uh, a street, uh, let's talk about a, what a road is. A road is a high-speed connection between two places. In the modern highway sense, a road is a replacement of the railroad, which is a road on rails, right? And when you got on a railroad, you got on at one place and you got off on another place. There were frontage railroads and drive-through railroads and all this stuff. You just, you got on here, you got off here. It was a very high-speed connection between two places. And when we design transportation infrastructure, we often design to function as a road. If you look at this, this has four lanes. They're wide, highway-style lanes. We put in turn lanes here to get the through traffic, you know, to flow more quickly, get the train traffic out of the way. So we've engineered this and we've spent the money to make this a very high speed, high capacity corridor. Does anyone get to move high speed through here? No, because we've set low speed limits, we've got all this complexity that slows everything down, we've got traffic signals. And so as a road, even though we've made the investment, it fails. What is a street? A street is a platform for creating and capturing value. That's what a street has always been. If you look at this, we put investments in here to make this a, a, a street. We put in uh, nice uh, decorative lighting. We put in wide sidewalks. We've narrowed some of the lanes on, on the, the north-south stuff that you can see here. Uh, you know, we've done the improvements here to try to make this into a street. But does it function as a street? Does it create and capture value? If you're shopping at this place here and you want to go to this place here, are you going to you know, walk across seven lanes? No. Are you going to walk down to the light, wait for it to turn, cross, walk back up? No. What are you going to do? You're going to get in your car, you're going to whip a U-turn, and come around and park there and go in, right? And the businesses all understand that. And so what have they done? They all built parking lots, they all have drive-throughs, and you get a financial return that tends more towards that shiny and new taco joint than that old and blighted uh, traditional. We've got to decide, are we building roads to connect places? Are we building streets to capture value? And unless we can make that decision about our transportation infrastructure, we're going to continue to spend enormous sums of money and get very little in return. Now, the DOTs are fantastic. and We have amazing knowledge in this country about how to build roads, how to build great high-speed connections between places. And literally, if local politicians got out of the way, uh, and quit demanding all these accesses that is going to give them that cheap, quick growth, uh, our highway systems would function really well. But it's on the other side of the equation that we really stumble. And I, I want to walk you through this because it's a different set of values that we need to apply, and you understand what they are already. Uh, you just got to be brave enough to speak up about it. If you look at the values that we apply, the engineering profession, of which I'm a part of, when we approach any street project, any road project, we ask a series of questions. The first one is, what is the speed that cars are need to travel at? What is the, in other words, the design speed? Then we ask the question, what is the volume of traffic we have to handle? After we have set the design speed and the volume of traffic, we then say, how do we make this into a safe road and at what cost? 
those are the engineering profession values in order of importance. Let me ask you this. If we're building a place for you, of those four values, which one is your most important? Safety. Safety. Of the remaining ones, which one is most important to you? Is it more important to you that cars be able to move quickly or that we be able to move a large volume of cars? Volume or speed? These are our values. And they're not reflected in the way we design and build our places. And I'm telling you, I go all over the country and it's the same answer. We all put safety first. We all put cost second. And until we do that within our cities, within our places, put safety first and put the, you know, the, the cost equation of return on investment second, uh, we're going to continue to build places that don't work. We're going to continue to build stroves, continue to build places that underperform, and continue to build places uh, that people are, are, don't gravitate to. If we want really productive places, we have to not be afraid to project our own values onto those places. This is the last concept I want to go through, and, and this is an adage that comes from Silicon Valley. Innovation that happens from the top down tends to be orderly but dumb, <laughs> while innovation that happens from the bottom up tends to be chaotic but smart. This is the, you know, the, the, the debate over the central server versus the individual PC, right? There was an idea that if we just built these huge central servers and let people plug into them, we could have all this computing power and, and and then there was this other kind of variant thought that said, you know, if we could just give people dummy machines, you know, not nearly as powerful as the big centralized computer, uh, we could just do that. Uh, everybody acting individually will have vastly more computing power than this, this big machine. And of course, you know, which one won that, right? If you're carrying around a, a, a phone today, uh, you know how that debate turned out. The bottom-up approach is amazingly powerful. Let's look at this from a city standpoint. You guys know where this is? This is Memphis, Tennessee. They would be embarrassed if you didn't know that. <laughs> Memphis is a fantastic city. Uh, I love Memphis. Um, but Memphis is going through a really uh, difficult time right now. If you look at the statistics, uh, Memphis and Detroit are often listed as one, two, and kind of, you know, one, they bounce back and forth. Uh, crime, out of wedlock births, percent of poverty, and go through the litany of statistics. Uh, Memphis has done everything that the post-World War II experiment told them to do. They've taken all the advice that they were told to take uh, in terms of creating growth and prosperity and wealth. They um, ran the highways through the middle of the city. They tore down buildings to build parking lots. They identified you know, slum neighborhoods, tore them down. Uh, and built new, uh, you know, improved, better neighborhoods. They built a beltway. They ran sewer water out to the edge of the community. They ran it past the beltway. They're building a second beltway. They subsidized businesses to move to Memphis. They subsidized businesses to stay in Memphis. They've pretty much done every single thing that you could do in the standard post-World War template to try to create growth, development, and prosperity. And it's remained elusive for them. The kind of pinnacle of this top-down, orderly but dumb approach is this right here. This is their basketball stadium. Uh, in the 1990s, they decided that uh, in order to be a world-class city, in order to create that growth and prosperity and opportunity, what they really needed was a national basketball team. And the way they were going to get a national basketball team was by going up and building a stadium and then luring one to move to Memphis. Now, they, they were successful in that, right? They got the Memphis Grizzlies. Here's the problem. The Grizzlies didn't like this stadium. And so they wound up building the Grizzlies another stadium about six blocks away. This has sat empty for over a decade. They're now in the process of giving $35 million of tax subsidy in order to attract Bass Pro Shop to move in and retrofit this place for a Bass Pro Shop. <laughs> Orderly but dumb. Okay? The, the search for the silver bullet, the solution, right? Let me show you what chaotic but smart looks like. 
This is also in Memphis. But this is a little street called Broad Avenue. Uh, Broad Avenue is an old streetcar stop, run down, neglected, uh, in disrepair. The people who live in this area uh, saw potential for it, but couldn't get the city to do anything. And so literally one Saturday in Monroe, they got buckets of paint, they put in their own crosswalks, their own bike lanes, they swept the sidewalks, they invited businesses to come in for a day and open up in these shops. They'd sweep up the shops, and they had an art gallery, they had a couple retail stores, they had someone selling ice cream, someone selling tacos. They didn't get Department of Health permits, they didn't get inspections, they didn't ask permission. They just went out and did it, right? And over the course of a weekend, they showed the potential of what could be out here. Now, I was out here six months after this project. Uh, before the project, uh, most of the storefronts were not filled. But I was out there and every single one was occupied. And I talked to the landlord of one of the buildings and the landlord said he was able to charge double the amount of rent for the last building than he was asking before the project took place. All the second floors are now full, all the third floors are full. The city's gone out and documented over $25 million of new private sector investment that's happened on these two blocks. Four dozen new jobs that have been created, 20 new businesses that have opened. Now, I don't know what you guys would do here if someone went out and did a project like this, but I can tell you what they would do in my city. Monday morning, they would be out. You'd have the city engineer saying, you know, that doesn't meet our standard crosswalk. Uh, you'd have the city attorney out saying, you know, that line's not straight, that's a potential liability for us. Um, you get the pressure washers out and you get rid of them, right? Mm -hmm. Memphis is desperate. They don't have people with enough time to bother with something like that. They don't have power washers, right? But Memphis has some really smart people, really smart people. <coughs> they actually did go out with pressure washers a few months later. But they went up with pressure washers to get rid of it so they could put it back permanently. And the mindset was, our residents identified for us a project that we, through our orderly but dumb system, never would have identified. We never would have picked this up. We never would have seen this as a pressing need. But our residents identified it, and it worked. And because it worked, we don't want it to go backwards. <clears throat> We're going to make this permanent. Now, they also did something quite remarkable. They said, well, we're going to go out there and do this. What would happen if we extended this out a couple blocks in each direction? Could some of the good vibes that are going on here kind of ooze over in the surrounding neighborhood? If it works, what are we out? You know, if it, if it, if it, if it doesn't work, what are we out? A little bit of paint, not a big deal. If it, if it works, could we get the same type of return on that investment that they got here? multiple, multiple returns. They looked around and said, are there other similar neighborhoods where we could go out and try a similar kind of experiment? Go out and spend a few hundred bucks on paint, get some people in, have a weekend where we activate the place and see what happens. What if it didn't work? Well, we're out a little bit, right? But if it does work, look at the potential. What Memphis is realizing is that from their city hall, from their offices, looking at their charts and their statistics and their maps, they have a tiny, tiny percent of the knowledge that the people actually living out in these neighborhoods have about what needs to happen. And the way they're gonna get this knowledge is by turning those people loose. This is my friend George. Uh, George uh, was an early reader of our blog. George is the kind of guy where I would post something at seven in the morning and at 7.05 there would be a comment uh, from George, Chuck, I don't get this, I don't understand, explain this a different way, I, I, this is, doesn't make any sense. Uh, George was a pain in my neck, right? One day George got my email address, he started emailing me all the time with questions about his city. Uh, he started, um, got my face, we became friends on Facebook, and then Facebook's got those little pop-up windows when someone's messaging you. I would be working and it was George, and I'd be working and George, it's like all the way up George. <laughs> Um, he, he was interested in our work, but he had no framework to process it with. Um, after about a year of this, he actually invited, he said, you know, Chuck, I'm, I'm starting to understand you. Uh, would you come to my community 
and do a curbside chat. And he set it up and we went there and, and he did that, it was a couple hours away. Uh, went and got a little tour of his place, met with a group, there were no city officials there, but you know, it was a nice group of neighbors and stuff, we had a conversation. Afterwards we went out to eat. I remember sitting there thinking, okay, I like this guy. He's, a, you know, he runs a daycare out of his home. Uh, he is a music major who plays trombone. Um, he is not a planner, he's not an engineer, he's not politically active. What am I doing with my life? You know, this is in the early days of me running a nonprofit, which I was not used to and had no clue what I was doing. And I thought to myself, is this what my life has become? You know, am I, am I, am, am I gonna run around the country meeting with George type people who have very limited ability to affect anything? I, I, I don't know if I can do this as a career. And I left there kind of feeling depressed because I like this guy a lot, a lot but I didn't see any way that this could amount to anything. Well, six months later, George sent me an email with a link to a video, and I clicked on the video. And here was George at his city council meeting, giving the curbside chat presentation to his council members that wouldn't show up to our presentation. Uh, he had taken our slides, and he had taken out my photos and put in photos of his community. And so as he went through, you know, it would be my analysis, and then his analysis, and then my photo, and then his photo. And I realized as I'm watching this that he's giving the curbside chat presentation that I could never give. He's giving the one of his community, of his place. George formed a neighborhood group. Uh, it started out with kids who were walking to school with his kids. They felt the walk was dangerous, and so they started walking with the kids every morning. And then they said, you know, we can improve this walk by planting some shrubs here and putting in a crosswalk here and doing some modest little improvements in different places. They started doing those. They started meeting at a local coffee shop. When applications would come into the city, they had a Walgreens come in. They're gonna tear down a couple of historic buildings. They showed up. They actually had a different design for the Walgreens and got the city to accept that instead of the one that the Walgreens engineers and planners submitted. All of a sudden, we're looking at this George going, this is the guy who's making all the difference. What cities around this country need is not more engineers, not better planners, not better you know, public officials or city administrators, but we need a more Georges. And so we actually sat down and said, how do we create a world where we get more <coughs> George? How do we get a world where more people are stepping up, taking ownership of their places, identifying those high return investments, those desperate needs that don't cost a lot, but have a huge impact on people's lives. Uh, last summer, we did a project in my hometown called Better Brain. And in October, we issued a report called Neighborhoods First. It details eight investments that the city can do in the neighborhood. Putting in a bike lane over here, painting a crosswalk here, trimming some trees over here, planting a couple trees over here. Little tiny things, total cost $16,700. But they were things that we identified by actually going out and being in the neighborhood, talking to people, walking behind them down the street and seeing where they cross, seeing where, you know, the, the old lady with the walker tried to get over the bank of snow, uh, watching where the mom with the stroller had to go through the ditch, right? When you get out there and actually start identifying them and say, wow, we can fix that problem with just a tiny bit of money, you start to identify with the high return investments. You can't do that with a public meeting. You won't do that with sticker charts on the wall. You won't do that with a survey. And you can't do that by looking at maps at City Hall. You actually have to get out of the neighborhoods and meet people and talk to them and watch the way they use the city. I went and sat down with the city engineer in my town. I said, you know, uh, we could really use a sidewalk along here. He said, really, why would you say that? <laughs> You won't identify those investments from an office. You gotta get up there and do it. And really, if we wanna find those high return investments, those ones where we can spend a penny and get a dollar back, uh, they're all around us. We have spent decades trying from the top down to engineer these wonderful cities with these big game-changing transformative projects. And what we've done is we've left pennies and nickels laying on the ground all over our communities. We need to reorient our governments to go out and pick those up. And when we go out and pick those up, 
will not only be making our communities wealthier and more prosperous, but we'll be doing it by improving the lives of our own residents, the prosperity of our own businesses, and we'll be enhancing the, the, the human wealth of the people that live within our communities. The current path that cities are on is not financially stable. We have all, to one degree or another, drank this post-World War II Kool-Aid. We have all built in the same style and pattern. And all of it is insolvent. We literally need to re-examine it and, and adopt a different approach. Because of this, the future for most cities is not going to resemble the recent past. Uh, we're you know, going through this economic transformation right now. Uh, it's hard to say what we're going to come out on the other side and look like. There's a lot of people who think that you know, this post-World War II trajectory we've been on, we're just going to continue to do that once we get through this. Uh, I don't see how that's possible. We have a different set of start conditions today than we did in 1950. We have different cities, we have different people, we have different amounts of debt, we have all this stuff that we've built that we have to now care for and maintain. We're a vastly different country. And unless we start thinking like a different country, uh, we're not going to be nearly as prosperous as we have been. And this leads me to the third point, which is the most critical. The main determinant of future prosperity for cities will be the ability of local leaders to transform their communities. And it's important to understand that by local leaders, we're not talking about the mayor, the city council, the city staff, the business leaders. These are important people, an important part of the conversation. But the leaders that we need to activate, the leaders that are really going to be the transformative ones, are those Georgians. They're the artists living in our neighborhoods. Uh, they're the person who walks their kids to school. It, it, it's, it's the person that shops at our local shops. If we can tap into those people and start to understand them, start to understand what their needs are, how they're interacting with our communities, they're going to point the way towards the transformation that needs to take place to make our cities healthy, prosperous, and strong. Um, I, I, I didn't want to end without mentioning the opportunity that is coming to this region next year. Uh, CNU, the Commerce for the New Urbanism, is an organization that I became involved in uh, after kind of going down this path. Uh, I started to ask some really tough questions of myself back when I was an engineer and then I was working as a planner. And I always found myself migrating towards the ideas that were emanating from the CNU. About five years ago, I started to get involved with them and it is a relationship that I am just thrilled to have made because they have been just an engine and a fountain of great ideas and innovation for this country. Their national gathering is going to be in Buffalo next year, uh, June 4th through 7th. That's the website where you can get more information. Uh, even if you can only make it for a day, it will be a day well spent. If you're interested in the issues we've talked about here, it is a four-day geek fest of planning, <laughs> urban issues. CNU used to be all about architecture. The, the latest CNUs have had art people, retail people, uh, builders, developers, this amazing, uh, you know, amazing uh, array of different people with different specialties. Come and be part of it. It's in your back door, uh, and it's going to be a wonderful thing. And then our website, I said I would give you uh, strongtowns.org. We do a blog. We do a podcast. We've got a video channel. Uh, all our content on there is free to use, to copy, to do what George did, which is change it for your community. Uh, you don't even, you know, just put your own name on it. I don't really care. Just get the ideas out there. Uh, we also have a social network at strongtowns.net. Um, that is the site for people who are interested in connecting with other people around the country who are trying to implement this kind of thinking. Uh, we form this group so that people can talk to each other, what works, what doesn't work, get ideas. Uh, we put out a book last year. Uh, I've got about a dozen copies of those up here. They're 10 bucks each. We're just trying to cover our costs with that. It is uh, kind of a 101 on Strong Towns thinking. If you want one of those, I've got some up here or they're available online. And then finally, uh, we started a new membership system. If you want to stay connected to what we're doing, uh, the best way is by becoming a member. That's the last link there. I'm thrilled to be here. I, I, I actually really enjoyed I was here in Niagara earlier, uh, or last year, and kind of went around the city and saw a lot of potential. And I really am excited about seeing you coming to Buffalo and the opportunities to get back here. So 
I'm excited about your future, uh, and I thank you for being here today and being part of this. Thanks so much.